Welcome back guys. In this video I'm going to talk about this new controller that I've designed. So this controller can wirelessly operate robotics projects, video games or anything else you can think of really. Not only is it versatile in its capabilities but it's also very easily programmable and features a screen and battery pack. I've also been thinking about how I can make these videos more useful for people who are learning to make their own projects. There are a lot of different skills that go into a relatively simple project like this. CAD design, electronics, PCB design, so I'm going to try and give an overview of each different skill set needed for different parts of the controller and be more specific about what my actual workflow was so that you, the viewer, can learn or build upon these skills yourself. This way you can not only follow along with my project but also gain the knowledge and skills to create your own projects. Now this controller is a work in progress so I would highly recommend subscribing to my channel so you can stay updated on the progress. Once the project is completed, I will publish the final video as well as free open source file downloads for anyone who wants to build it themselves, modify it, etc. And if you're interested in downloading the work in progress files, I have them available on my Patreon page. So if that's something you'd be interested in, consider supporting me over there. As some of you may know, I have previously made controllers for my animatronic designs. However, these controllers had a very limited controls and had to be plugged into a PC or an Arduino to work. I wanted something more versatile for potential future robotics projects that may have more actuation or other unforeseeable requirements. And I wanted to create a controller that can be used for a wide range of projects, not just for animatronics. In addition to versatility, I also wanted to have a controller that could communicate wirelessly, eliminating the need for cables and wires. Lastly, I wanted to make sure that the controller could operate on a battery, making it easy to use the controller on the go without having it tethered to a power outlet. With all these considerations in mind, I set out to design a new controller that would be versatile, wireless and battery powered. And that's how the project began. First and foremost, the inputs of the controller include four potentiometer joysticks, eight switches, three potentiometers and a switch joystick. This provides a wide range of options for controlling and manipulating the various functions of the controller. The controller also features a programmable screen, which allows for easy navigation and control of the different functions of the controller. Additionally, there's a removable battery pack, which makes it easy to replace the battery when it runs out of power. To enable wireless communication, I've included an XB communication system. This allows for easy and efficient wireless communication with other devices, but I'll talk a bit more about that later on. Finally, at the heart of the controller is an Arduino Mega, which acts as the microcontroller that processes all other components. I chose an Arduino Mega because it has so many digital and analog pins for inputs. However, there are options like multiplexing, which would allow me to process multiple signals through one pin. This project, as I mentioned, is a work in progress, so later on I'd like to slim it down a lot, but for now it's nice to use an overqualified board, so I have less to worry about. The controller has three PCBs, one for the front panel, including the screen, one for the joysticks and potentiometers, and the final board is just an Arduino shield. All these PCBs are doing is connecting the components to the Arduino. It can be intimidating to see designs using PCBs if you're new to this stuff, but all they're doing is replacing breadboards and jumper wires. The front PCB has two outputs. One of them is literally just the same output as the screen. As you can see, the traces just shift the output down a few millimeters. The other output handles all the signals from the buttons on the front. They're all just simple push to make switches, including the joystick, which is just a five in one tactile switch. So the only connections for each switch is one going to ground and another going to a digital input pin on the Arduino. Pull up resistors written into the Arduino code mean that we don't even need any resistors between the switches and ground because the microcontroller is handling that for us. The middle PCB is responsible for handling all the signals from the joysticks and potentiometers. Unfortunately, I used the wrong sized header pins in the PCB and had to get some machined header pins as they were the only type that would fit, just to prove the concept. The Arduino Shield PCB is the final piece of the puzzle. It acts as the bridge between all the other PCBs and the Arduino itself, and it connects to the other PCBs via a ribbon cable, which delivers all the signals to the Arduino for processing. Now, a few people mentioned in the comments of my previous video that it's not actually very hard to solder surface mount components, 
by hand, but maybe you guys underestimate how clumsy and useless I really am. I made quite a mess of this mini joystick and ended up with a few buttons no longer working. Joking aside, I think this has more to do with my soldering setup and just inexperience with such tiny parts. You guys are correct, it's not too difficult to solder surface mount components by hand. Also, a big thank you yet again to JLCPCB for providing me with the circuit boards for this project. What can I say other than that they're fast, cheap, have a range of options and every board I've received has come out perfect. Check out my affiliate link in the description if you'd like to order your own PCBs through JLCPCB. I started designing my new controller by using an Xbox 360 controller as reference, since it's my favourite video game controller and I think it feels the nicest out of any controller I've held before. I laid out the positions of all the components and worked out how they would need to be on different PCB layers due to their different heights. To get a sense of the overall structure, I made mock PCB shapes to block out the areas where the components would be placed. Next, I designed the real PCBs in Fusion's eCAD and the skeleton that would link them together. I also used Fusion's form tool to design the case for the controller. For some reason, Fusion couldn't make the shell hollow. Presumably, I just had too many tight fillets for it to calculate, so I had to export it as an STL file and use MeshMixer to hollow it out. Side note, MeshMixer is my secret weapon. The girls that get it, get it. After that, I brought the shell back into Fusion and used Fusion's plastic add-in to make the screw holes. The add-in is probably more expensive than what it's worth if you're only going to use it for design features like this, but if you have the money to burn, it does make your design process a lot quicker. I printed it in GameCube purple at 0.8 layer height, which looked a bit nasty, so as an experiment I tried using some high build filler primer and purple spray print, and now I'd say it just looks a bit nasty in a different way. XB is a small electronic device that allows different devices to communicate wirelessly with each other. It uses the ZigBee protocol, which is known for low power consumption and is suitable for embedded systems, robotics and other applications. These devices can be connected to other electronic devices like microcontrollers and computers to transfer data and control them wirelessly. The configuration and setup of these devices can be done easily via USB and free software called XCTU. It's very quick to have two XBs communicating back and forth. I have a few reasons for choosing to use XBs over other options like Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, but probably the main driving force was just that I wanted to try out something new. To get them up and running, there's some very quick setup in XCTU, as I mentioned, and it's also quite a handy tool to check that they're communicating properly. The actual Arduino code needed to connect to and transmit data using the XB is also really simple. We'll literally just type in xb.begin and xb.write. Having said that, you do need to give some thought as to how you're going to encode and decode the information you send in. So I want to take an analog reading from my joystick, which will be a value between 0 and 1024. I scaled this down because I don't need that much resolution and I want it to be able to transmit the data in a char variable which I don't think can go as high as 1024. Sending information between XBs is pretty much like printing to the serial monitor, but you need to give some thought as to how you encode that information. I used a specific character to mark the, to mark the start of the data packet, separators which reduce commas, and a terminating character to signal the end of the packet. Another consideration is how that data is received and interpreted. So when we're sending numbers as chars, the value that you're sending is actually a character that corresponds to a number in an ASCII table. So if I want to send the number 119, I'm actually sending a lowercase w. This is nice because it means each value is a single character and it's easy to send and decode that information and not have to worry about the lengths in digits of each value that you're sending. So what happens if the reading you want to transmit from your joystick corresponds to the same character as the start or end character? For this reason we use a new character which we're calling the escape character. I'm just using a plus sign in this example. We check to see if the joystick reading is the same value as our start, end or escape character and if so we place the escape character before the value that we want to transmit and this signals to the receiver that we didn't mean to end the packet or start a new one and you should in fact take the next value as its literal numerical value and not its function as a marker. 
There's also some code you'll need on the receiver side, but that explains the concept, and I think I'll go into more detail on specifics in the second part of this project. So clearly there are some obvious design flaws, like the joystick holes being the wrong size, and it doesn't fit together quite as I would like. Aside from that, there are some other things I want to change. Firstly, there's no reason for the XB shield to be separate from my input shield. Sparkfun's XB board is really simple and it's open source, so I'm fairly confident I can just take their design and my design and just smush them together into one. Secondly, I want some triggers on the back of this controller. Uh, Sparkfun used to sell a PCB trigger, but for some reason they don't anymore. I would like to essentially make my own version of that design and integrate it into my controller. It's not the most straightforward thing to make because, if you think about it, the rotation produced by the trigger is actually very small, maybe less than 20 degrees, and to make it feel right in the hands I don't think it's a good idea to place a potentiometer directly at the centre of rotation of the trigger. I will also need a spring in there to return the trigger to its neutral position, so lots to think about clearly. Okay, so that concludes part one of this controller build. Next month's video is going to be something a little bit more visual, so hopefully you'll come back for that. A huge thank you, as always, to all of my patrons who make these videos possible. As I mentioned, I'm going to be posting all of my work in progress files on my Patreon page, so head over there if you want to access those. Cheers guys, see you in the next video.